Uh, hello, everyone. This is uh, Bob Barnes Q&A number six. We are uh, in August 2021, and uh, Bob's over in Italy, and I'm here in Cambridge. And today we are going to talk about mixing. Mixing is one of those wonderful dark arts that we all have to do as composers, and um, something we, we're okay at doing, but definitely something which we would have def- we prefer to employ a specialist if we if once we get into the uh, Nitty gritty of it, but ultimately, as composers, we need to reduce our demos to a sufficient quality to a get the message over to the clients and b sound good as as good as our competitors. So, but it's a bit of a dark art. What really, what is mixing? Well, in simple terms, it's conveying the it's conveying our mu- the message in our music. It's us making a decision as to what we want listeners to hear, what we want to focus upon, and what we don't want them to focus upon. There's a creative aspect to it, and there's a there's a uh, technical aspect to it. The technical aspect is simply, can I hear this? Is it being masked by something else? Or a creative aspect is, do I want to hear this? Or you know, is it emotionally? From that perspective, there are different uh, lots of different things we can talk about as part of mixing. And I think the first thing we will go talk about is our different mixing approaches. So from that perspective, I will first talk, hand over to Bob and talk about uh, the difference between linear and non-linear mixes. Yeah, I mean, we work in, in both areas of you know, film and TV and also interactive media like video games. And the approach is quite different or can be quite different in, in both situations. Of course, it depends on the project and it, it depends on what the client wants from us. But we're working on a project right now, for example, where um, we, we, we're providing stems actually to the client so that they can do their own mixes. And of course, with interactive music, you might often have the game mixing on the fly. Uh, so it's not, not something that we might not find ourselves presenting and delivering the very final product. It might be that, that more work needs to be done on their side in order to, to create the final, final stems and sections of music in order for the game to play it back. Can you, uh, Linear, guys, well, can you, can you explain yeah. to people what stems are? Oh, st- stems are just the individual tracks. So, you know, it could be guitar, drums, bass. Drums actually, interestingly, might themselves have a number of stems like you you when you record a drum kit you'd have a microphone pointing at each element of the drum kit and then you'd you'd have overhead stems and you'd probably record some of the ambience of the room as well so you might have um two room mics as well so all together you could have eight ten tracks all making up eight ten stems let's say for a drum kit and with an orchestra that's probably magnitude of 50 odd it's a huge number of stems recorded and, and separate microphones on each section. Of course, there's there's the, the problem of bleed from one section to the other. So the spot mics are there to allow you to influence the mix without like changing it fundamentally because you haven't got that isolation. But with uh, getting back to our mixing uh discussion the the linear music of course is is much more straightforward we're writing for film and tv it's always the same each time you watch it so the music doesn't need to change and react to that so that means that we can not only make the music match the picture completely but we can provide the final mix for our clients and you know that that's something that we always have to do but of course we as barn said we always try to employ a specialist, someone who's very dedicated to that job and has been doing it for years. Of course, they understand the ins and outs and the really um, detailed work, let's say, that may not be something that we're privy to. I think we're, we're quite knowledgeable when it comes to mixing in various different styles, but of course, nowhere near as knowledgeable as someone who's been doing it for 20 or 30 years. So, I mean, the next thing would be to discuss the kinds of tools that we use. And, um, you know, we've we've got loads and loads of plugins that we use in our mixes, Um, starting with the Waves plugins. We've we've used those for many, many years and we find to be incredibly useful. And from, from EQ and Reverb 
distortions for guitars. Uh, well, actually, not just for guitars, for whole mixes. Um, there's there's an unlimited number of tools in there, which which are just absolutely fantastic for sorting sorting the mix out, and making everything sound clear. Um, I also really like Melodyne. That's that's an amazing tool that we've that we've had for a few years. And it's something that allows you to record, let, let's say you've got a polyphonic recording like a guitar and all the notes are bleeding into each other. Melodyne, it's, I don't know, it's like black magic to me, but it allows you to actually um, retune individual notes within that polyphonic recording, which is, you know, as, as I said, not something that, that really should be feasible unless you recorded each of the notes independently, but actually Melodyne has got a very clever way of doing that. And it's, it's an amazing tool. If you come back to a guitar recording, let's say, and one of the notes sounds a little bit off, it's not perfectly in tune. Actually, you can really sort that out with Melodyne, which is unbelievable. What, what tools do you like using by? Well, again, I would also say that I'm a big fan of the wave stuff that you talked about. I also quite like isotope. Isotope have a yeah. suite of tools. Now we're kind of get sort of jumping around here, but because this, I'm kind of getting into more mastering tools rather than particularly mixing. I mean, for me, uh, mixing is, is, is for different instruments, genres of music. It's a it's a simple it's a simple question of what do I want this to hear, what and how do I want to present this. Uh, so you can think about things from a, a kind of an audio uh, spectrum as the frequency we hear, down to as low as, well, we can hear roughly between 50 and 100 hertz for the, for the low bass stuff, up to about 20,000 hertz for high frequency stuff. So first off, you can then pick, try to roughly pick where your instrument sits within the frequency spectrum. Obviously, when your bass instrument is down low, now, a classic thing to do when you're mixing is to um, not have any high end, any, any high end, any higher frequencies in your bass instrument. Unless you want your bass to sound like it's a, if it's a bass guitar, you want to hear the guy plucking the actual the kind of you can hear the strings being plucked and, and, and scraped by the player. You'll need to you'll need to hear the high frequencies. But if you want it to sound more like a sub bass, then you're just going to effectively roll all that off and you'll just hear the low end, which is great because then it gives you the high end frequencies are free for other instruments to come together. Oh, and then you're not they're not just constantly trying to interact with each other and trying to you know who's going to get dominance then you've also got they sit in their own space exactly and then you've got the same thing yeah. it's like with panic where do you sit between the left and right speakers uh interesting enough having done this for 30 years now there's only one project in the entire career i've been asked to mix in surround sound so pretty much music is still 99.9 percent .9 of the time from our perspective still mixing stereo so as we listen to everything's headphones, mm. where does the sound fit within it? As most people are uh, similar to like movies, movies are mixed, dialogue is pretty much always in the middle. So, you know, you can say that. And there's only mm. the same with certain so voice on a, on a song. You very rarely do you hear someone singing either to one side, it's pretty much straight in the middle. You might hear backing vocals, so a few people kind of spanned around the stereo field to make it sound wider, but generally the lead singer's gonna be in the middle. So you've got those, those are the simple tools. And then you've got, then you've got far more, then you've got the uh, tools which you can uh, add to each of your tracks, each of your instruments, to, to make them either to, uh, either to, as a creative effect, such as distortion, delays, reverb, and so on and so forth, or, or something, yeah, simply as a, as a, an effect to help balance it. Compression is something we haven't talked about to begin with. And compression is an enormously important part of music. Compression is something where you effectively, you, it's a sort of gain reduction, sort of, you, you, you limit the, the, the you limit the, uh, the volume effectively of one particular element, which, but it, when, it, and when it goes over that volume, you squash it to make sure that it stays within that area. Effectively, it, limit, it limits the dynamic range of particular instruments, but it also can be used as creative effects, something which we've heard. Most vocals, for example, you hear on a pop track will be heavily compressed. So the singer will sound like they're really, really close to the microphone. And, um, and, and even if they're shouting, it doesn't really get much. You know, the, the, you see us the waveform, it doesn't look much louder, mm. much quieter. It sort of, it, 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 it brings the quiet elements up with that, the, the, the high elements down. And just, just to add something to that, um, 
I remember when we discussed this uh, uh, in the very early days of me studying this at university, they, they explained that, you know, on a, on a sound like a snare drum, where it's got a very, very sharp transient peak, which is, jumps up like that and then drops right the way back to almost nothing um you your ear just can't hear that it's it's just it's too fast and it happens too suddenly so when you put a compressor on that and chop and chop it back and, sh and reshape the waveform so that 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 doesn't jump out in that way um you you don't really hear any change whatsoever but what you've done now is you you you've chopped that back to such a level that it doesn't distort. So now you can make the whole thing louder, knowing safely that the drum, the snare drum is not gonna distort at that point. So as, as you say, Brian, you know, it, it limits the dynamic range of the instruments and it means then you can make it fit within the dynamic range of your system more neatly and get the best signal to noise ratio. You can also make things sound pH mate. You can really, yes, yeah. you know, you can it's on its own. It's, I, I, I equate it to like to, to the sound of a real gunshot versus the sound of a shot in that gunshot in the film. Mm. One sounds a bit weedy, one sounds epic and powerful. And ordinarily, yeah. it's not which is epic and powerful, is nothing like the real thing. Mm. Exactly the same as you, know, you hear snare drum when it sounds, it's just like, like that. But you hear snare drum in a big fat rock track and it sounds huge and, and enormous. And a lot of the, lot mm. of the reason for the character that sound will come from the pressure. So, I mean, yeah. so you've got these various tools and, and now brilliantly because of everything's now on the computer in the past, we used to have rack out more bits of gear to, and stuff would have, and in, instruments have to be sent to a to a, a, an effects processor, either it was an insert or auxiliary. So you're either adding to the sound or replacing the sound, and then come back. But the different the, the, the problem with that is that unless you had a uh, an effects a reverb delay or all these effects for every single channel, you're always going to make compromises. You're going to say, well, I, I would compress the vocal, but I then can't compress the snare drum because I'm only got one compressor or both. But now with everything inside the computer, you can literally open up a track and go, what effect will on top of that? And you can those. Mm. Well, but, uh, depending on how powerful your computer is, you can just keep adding uh, more effects, which is a fantastic way of working because it allows us so much creativity to mm. uh, One thing that I, I mean, the way reason why we, we'd always say, given the preference we would hire an external mixer, is because they have this godlike knowledge of what goes really well either in outboard and physical outboard gear or with plugins, which we don't have that level of knowledge. And mm -hmm. I would say that there was certain black art, like mixing a modern rock track or modern pop track, it sounds like there's actually only a few elements. It might be a, a you know, bass drum guitar vocal, and that might be it, or some kind of yeah. electronics. But actually, the magic of making that all sing together is a combination of, if you if you ever, if you ever to see that, in a, in a digital audio workstation, how many plugins have got on it, how much they've got on it to make it sound as, as fat as that. It's mm -hmm. really quite, it's really hard, quite eye opening how much effort uh, they go into the production side of the music other than singing the composition. But that's why modern pop music is what it is, because it's a constantly yeah. evolving base. People want it to sound, people want a certain type of sound. And the sound that we, we make when we were recording guitar 50 years ago versus what the sound that we can do now it's, it's hugely yeah. different and the way that we can process vocals and the way we can process that there's something which we have uh, there's, there's there's little clever things where you're using one effect to control another effect power down compression being one of the more side chain compression where you're using a um, you can have a, a side chain effect compression is the most obvious way to make something really dumb you can have a kind of a constant sound like a, like a, a bass sound or a pad sound but the, uh, the the bass is or the pad is dipped when the back you can link it to a bass drum. That's classic. So mm. every time a bass drum is triggered, it it triggers the compression. So it lowers the volume on this pad or this bass. You can go whoop, it kind of gives you that warm effect only when the bass drum hits. But it's it's, it's a like very, a pump, pumping the mix yeah, like a, a classic it's, David yeah, Guetta. It's, yeah, it's a classical it's a classic sound, but for really. Um, for, for linking two things together and really making them. Mm. So there's all these various tools at our disposal, uh, most of which are available on any digital audio workstation these days. That's uh, readily cost. 
So the question just, is... But just to add some... Uh, well, just before you move on, I just wanted to add one thing to that. And that is, you know, I, I guess our mixing skills come, come down to just simply um, getting things positioned and leveled correctly and accurately in the mix. So, you know, reverb gives you depth, pan gives you width, and, you know, EQ allows you to try and create some separation between the instruments. Probably as much as we kind of do with our mixes. And then, and, but then you, you listen to top, top recording engineers and mix engineers like Jack Joseph Puig and the way they talk about mixing. And it's a different world. I, I remember hearing him say, I think of myself as, an, as the, the sixth member of the band. And I'll often sit with them in the room while they're rehearsing or practicing. And I listen, I try and work out what makes them sound like they sound. Are they rough around the edges? Are they, you know, are they very, very tight and accurate? You know, what, what is the thing that makes them who they are? And when you start applying that level of sort of creativity and using plugins in order to enhance certain things, or they're, they're quite sort of dirty and loose, you don't over edit the sound. You, you know, you use a, you know, dirty kind of reverbs, maybe something more retro. And, and they have this, this field of knowledge, this, this, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years of experience of knowing all the tools that are out there and what they've got in their studio and how they're going to apply that to a particular band. And that's where, you know, our knowledge is well cut off and why you would want to use a, a top-notch engineer because they'll apply those, that, that level of knowledge to what you're doing. What is it that makes this track beautiful or not beautiful or edgy or, you know, and what can I do to enhance that? Absolutely. Anyway. So I would, yeah, so it's, it's, it's totally sensitive, Max. I would say that in the past we've been, so if you're either blessed with a decent enough budget to record and how hire an engineer, you don't really say to go for it but we are our, our mixed knowledge has to be at a, at a sufficient level to allow us to at least present our demos to our clients and have our pictures sound as good as the way yeah so uh another kind of a mixing approach is how do we do it together i, I mean there really is no substitute for more than one set of ears there really is um mm. there's a way you know and but it's ultimately check each other's work that i would say the the most the most common problem we have with mixing is not giving ourselves enough ear breaks. The problem is with anything, anything we write, whether it's because it's, you get used to the you get used to the routines and, and hearing it differently sounds old when you hear. But ultimately, the same exact same thing happens with mixing: is your ears get very very used to a certain sound, and actually you start to think it's okay. But it's, it's funny actually because one of our one of our dear friends, a guy called Walter, but he was a mix engineer for me. He was, a, he was up until many few years ago an avid smoker and he would use the smoke for going out for a bag break every I don't know, half, half an hour. Was it enough 15 time? seconds, I think it was. Yeah, was it, uh, it was enough time to give his ears a break and you come in. And I'm exactly yeah. the same with him when he's exactly the same with writing anything. I mean, the, pro the, the, the large problem I would say in our particular side of things is. Especially if you're what if, if time is against you, mixing is something you're always doing at the end. And just while you're doing on the phone, you never you never sit there and go. I spent a day writing or two days writing it, and I spent a day mixing it. No, generally I spent two days writing it. I've got to deliver it now, and then that's the, all you're doing. Is you're, it's you're checking the levels. You're making sure that everything can be heard, but you're not applying any creativity at that point. So you're not going, what plugin can I apply to this bass and make it sing a little more? Or maybe a nice guitar ring, um, uh, distortion, just you know, something like that, just to give it a little bit. And that's where that's where having an, an expert mixer makes you. And there are yeah. also other things you can do to help to help uh, help improve your mixes. One of the most common, the classic one is listen to in different environments. We all we've all got lovely, hopefully lovely speakers speakers that we're all working with. And we're very used to them. And, um, but they do, every speaker will colour a sound to a certain degree and they will promote certain frequencies and, and, and not be as sort of playable as others. So the classic is, is about God. I always remember when we 
this I was in a very steamed about it bounce the breath and bounce the tape to a, a bounce out down to a tape and then goes to the bottom by the lake and the list on the tape of the car. Yeah. And uh, that was the classic to do. And these days the equipment is listed on your phone. Of course, phone speakers are um, demonstrably different than everything you put one in the studio. And but some there's kind of a halfway house, something which bought this guy a few years ago called Ava Avantone Mix Q. It's I mean, obviously I can't really show it to you, but it's about yay big. And uh, basically it's a one mono speaker. And we now put our mix system there. And it's amazing. You put a mono system. So, uh, I, I, I mean you have to tell me explain more as to the mechanics as yeah. to why they're useful. But ultimately I, don't, I mean the basic I mean, most, most studios have a, will have a kind of a grot box of some sort, like some awful speaker. It might even be like an old raster blaster that they have the ability to pipe the mix directly through it just to hear it through terrible, awful speakers. And that's sort of the basic principle of, of the Aventone, although hopefully it doesn't sound quite as bad as something like that. But the principle is, is that if you can make something sound good, on, on a very, very poor quality system, then it's gonna sound good on a high quality system. And the Aventon mix cubes, they, they have, you know, they don't extend to a very low frequency range. I don't know exactly what the frequency range is, but it's not, you know, deep basses and it's not very, very high, uh, high sibilant uh, frequencies in the top range either. But you have, so it, it, may, it forces you to focus on the mid of your mix and therefore and that's where most of your instruments sit you know there's there's frequency components from the bass you know that maybe the the fundamental pitch of the bass is is you know much lower say than a guitar but if you look at you know say a single note on the bass and a single note on the guitar and you compare the frequency ranges actually that you know they it's surprisingly overlap a lot more than you'd imagine they do and and so what the Aventone does is it makes you kind of focus on the mid frequencies where it's mostly cluttered and if you can hear all the instruments within there then there's a good chance that your mix has plenty of separation and you'll be able to hear everything a few times and I've that's the basic it. principle so i said a few times i've used it a, a mix which sounds perfectly fine on my normal standard monitors play on the avatar and one element would jump out Really? Why? Is that yeah. Out? And it's something obviously. So I, and have I follow that because I'm thinking that clearly is not going to sound great. So I'll drop it down. And industry enough, yeah. it may not sound. It may not sound a great deal of difference when I go back to my normal speakers. But yeah. there is obviously something within it which has been uh, the avatar is highlighted. So yeah, it's 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 a. It's well, a there's one other thing. Just, just to say, it's one other thing as well, and that's that mono thing that you talked about. Uh, the point about having one of them, not two of them, is that surprisingly enough, there are still many, many situations in everyday life where people listen to a piece of music in, in mono. And, and so that means either they're just stripping the left channel or the right channel and you're only hearing that, which, which is awful because you're losing so much information. More likely than not, what's happening is it's a sum of both of the channels and, the, and then, um, you know, they, uh, a reduction in volume so it doesn't distort. And if you're doing something like that and summing the left and the right channel, you're in danger of getting phase cancellation at that point. So, you know, the, the basic principle is if you take a, a sine wave, which is shaped like that, and the exact mirror image of that sine wave and you play them both together at the same time, you end up with a straight line and they cancel each other out completely and you don't hear anything. And so, you know, in, in basic terms, if something like that happens in your mix because you've got a reverb, let's say, that's out of phase with the, with the actual original sound, when they come together in the mix and if you, if you sum them together, you might end up getting phase cancellation. It happens, a classic thing with snare drums where one's, one mic's on the top, one's on the bottom. If the cable happens to be longer on the the, the the mic on the bottom or the top, you can you can end up having a phase issue between the two. And these things are things that, you know, I mean, top-notch engineers can really hear that. Um, I'm not sure I'm good enough to really hear that 
myself, but testing it in a in a mono environment where you sum the two channels together, you can at least tell that, oh my God, where's where's the guitar gone? You know, and it gives you a decent clue as to whether you've got some phasing problems. And then you can go in and start tweaking that. Another trick I've ever bought it from another channel for engineering performance presenters is that when you turn things down, when you get sort of low, reasonably low volume, the bass should disappear. Bass is still there, the bass is here. And yeah. these little tricks, over the years we've done this, our mixing has become, I would say, competent. Not expert, but competent. And yeah. And there, are, and there are times, given the fact that you know, either the budget constraints, the time constraints don't allow, so we had to make make the best of the one we Yeah, and, uh, and actually, just to add, just to add to that, if you start mixing and listen, if you're listening in, sorry, Bob, your video is gone. My video disappeared there. Sorry, I got a call came in there. I'm using my phone. Um, if you, uh, what was I saying? Oh, listening in different environments. Basically, you need to listen in lots of different environments as well because. If your room happens to be particularly bassy in some way, you might well be mixing all your mixes with, with a lack of bass. Um, so listening in lots of lots of different places in, in as you know, put it on a on a flash drive or on your phone, play it in the car. And in any way you can listen outside of your environment means that you don't trust that space and 100 percent And that's really important because who's fortunate enough to have had a room that's been completely optimized with bass, you know, and bass traps put in all the right places and so on. You know, top-notch engineers, top-notch studios have had that. You know, in my in our cases, you know, we've got soundproofing up and the rooms certainly sound better, but it's not really been done in any way in a in a scientific kind of a way with you know proper measurements and so on. So, you know, you, you can't, you can only go so far as with trusting that room and listening in your car, listening, you know, bringing one of my mixes around to your place and having a listen there and getting a broader knowledge of how it sounds in different places means that you can be more confident or less confident about each and every mix. Because if there's no bass when you listen to it in the car, it might be that, that you're, you're mixing the bass down too low. And then you need to make some, some notes about that. And this is why actually a lot of decent mix engineers will have a set list of tracks in different genres and styles, uh, a playlist, if you like, of yeah. tracks they know really, really well. Yeah, and then it was, yeah, and they know exactly how they sound in each space. So when, when they go into a studio they've never been in before and they start playing it in that studio, they can suddenly tell oh, actually, I know this track really well and the bass is really raw in that. Can't hear it at all in this. You know, what's what's going on? Where's where's all your bass? So it gives them a point of reference. So I think, yeah, I think hopefully that's given us, given you at least a few pointers as a point of action when it comes to mixing. It's such a, such a, a mind put of complexities as, as my own, said, Jack, Jack. Uh, Joseph Purig, he is the six man boot. I mean, if we have something mixed our stuff, they they are, I would say, adding as much creativity as we are when we're writing the tracks. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's important That's to a level say beyond. A, yeah. I would say a few, I would say a few well known artists, I would imagine there are a few unsung heroes who have made who have helped define their sound over the years. It's probably a big part of their engineering. So hopefully that will give you some useful information on, on mixing. I think we have, we also managed to, get, we were asked a couple of questions. I think we're going to try and keep this q and a bit short this time. So we're simply going to answer one of the questions that we got asked this week. And the question was, including many evil instruments, as in many evil, and one of many evil, getting, special, getting specialist positions in, how and why? So I will take. I will start with this, and Bob can Bob can turn out and as it to it too. I would say parts. There are there are two sides of this. One is um, as composers, you sort of. I suppose it, it sounds a little bit. Um, a little bit. How do I put it nicely? Poetry to say, but many people are asked to. What's your sound? Why the? Why would we come to you? 
and there were a few reasons, but one of them is what is your sound? Are you a specialist in this particular area? And even though when we started doing this, we were you know, effectively all just jumping in those, just getting the work we were in. What kind of music do you actually like to write? Uh, the first game which helped us all define that was going to be Hunting Cats in 2003. And that was simply because for the first time we recorded any instruments. In this case, it was a uh, four tracks instrument, say a flute, a uh, harp, a um, violin, one other I shall And But a dulcet. And what is, what is open our eyes up to? How wonderful these ethnic instruments sound. And over the year, over the few years ensuing, we started adding more and more to this. We discovered the sound of the air, which is the Chinese violin, and that's become a main component of the fair view of our schools. So, from that perspective, we like getting in, uh, we like getting in spe specialist instrument players because they help us to uh, achieve a sound, which we hate to think is hopefully. Well, no, not completely unique, but at least vaguely something which is, we could say is on all of our signature sounds. So, in a, in a nutshell, it helps fusing our. It's, it's, I hate the word fusion, but ultimately, we like to fuse different musical styles. And whether there be an orchestra and what band, a load of random ethnic instruments, the ethnic instruments and the work, having instrument of world music is something which we love to do. And just from a purely uh, Pretty purely uh, educational level. It's lovely to learn about all these different instruments. Mm. There's nothing more satisfying than saying, "Well, we're now we've been asked to pitch on a game which is set in this country, or working on a game which is here." And there's a game we did a couple of years ago called Sunny with Mix, and it was a uh, there were various arena, sports or sporting arenas in the future in different locations, and so we made sure the locations. I think one, one, one in Brazil. Um, like the we went to the combination of YouTube, Wikipedia, and so on and so forth, we found out the instruments from local nations in area and made and had ethnically uh, suitable or accurate uh, versions of the same tracks produced for that particular area. So yeah, I would say that as a part of what we do, we like to bring in some unusual work. Some people like to focus on doing unusual work electronics and log synths so that kind of stuff. I think our sound would like to mix um, like to mix the sound of ethnic world instruments to help us create our sound. Does that make sense, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean one thing I'd say as well to add to that is that we you know we've always been very well aware of music is uh, a collaborative pastime if you like it's, it's it's a collaborative part of the process for us is is always working with other musicians and discussing with them what we might do we have our ideas we can discuss sometimes even sing lines to players and then they they throw back to us something that their interpretation if you like of things it goes right the way through to recording orchestras you know you put all the dots on the page you put exactly where they should get loud where they should get quiet where they should slow down where they should speed up you do all of those things, but still, even within that framework, there's a huge amount of interpretation that they bring to the table that you never get from a computer demo doing a string line or something like that. And, and it's, that, it's that sort of organic element that really brings music to life. And without having players, even just one player on stuff, is something which you always like to do, without having that stuff on there, um, you, you don't end up... You, don't, you end up with something that sounds very, very stilted, possibly unnatural. And I think we've always liked our music to have a live element, just, just to breathe life into the music and, and make it more emotive, make it say something. And, you know, that's, that's, why, that's why I've always loved doing that. And I think it's why, it's why we'll always try to do that in some way or another. Yeah. So hopefully that answers answer that question and hopefully we'll uh, have something more equally interesting to talk about to you next month thanks so much cheers ciao